Hey everybody, welcome to the channel. This is my first YouTube channel. Uh, it's my first set of videos that I've ever really put out there. Um, so no better way to do it than with a topic that I've absolutely fallen in love with, which is the world of aquascaping. Uh, there's so many videos online about aquascaping, but I kind of just wanted to put my own twist on it. Um, show a little bit of what I have created and the experiences that I have had. And uh, if you like the videos, I would be really appreciative if you could uh, hit the subscribe button or give me a thumbs up. Um, so uh, on this particular video today, I just kind of wanted to step through my aquascape, uh, the one that I put together myself. Uh, some of the um, trials and tribulations that I have had with this aquascape and, um, you know, how I set out to plan it and, and pretty much put it together. So without further ado, let's jump straight into it and I'll uh, explain exactly how I went from uh, this to this. So basically the first thing I wanted to talk about is what actually got me into aquascaping to begin with. So I've always kept fish, uh, probably in my, I started doing it in my late teens, uh, and probably finished keeping fish maybe about when I was in my mid twenties. Um, so I'm in my mid thirties now, so I kind of gave it up for about 10 years and I kind of didn't go back to it, but, um, I was actually over at a friend's house, um, a friend of my wife and her husband actually, uh, breeds, um, uh, endlers, uh, guppies. So, um, I actually saw the tanks and again immediately fell in love with fish again and I was like oh my god it's been years since I've kept them I'd love to keep them again. So what I actually ended up doing was just going online looking for aquariums that I could pretty much just pick up cheap and see if I could put one together but my nature is to pretty much do everything to the maximum I don't pretty I don't really do anything by half so when I take on a hobby I jump straight in the deep end with it and I try and do it the best that I can. So um, I actually saw a, an aquarium online for, it was a 30 long and a girl was selling it, but I actually missed out um, and I managed not to pick that one up, which was very disappointing for me. Uh, but in the end, I actually ended up building this aquarium myself because everywhere I looked online for them, they were super expensive and I just kind of thought, well, I'm pretty handy. I may as well just try and build this myself and see how it works out which is what I did and that had challenges by itself and I could probably make a separate video on that but um, yeah you'll see from some of the pictures before I put it together that it was pretty much the shell of glass and now it's turned into something quite beautiful so yeah I'm pretty pumped with how it came out and how it ended up and really happy to where I got it so um, let's start talking about a few things uh, that I have learned along the way and some of the equipment that I bought for it and how I decided to set it up. So let's talk about the, the size and the setup of it to begin with. So I originally decided to go for a low long aquarium because we have a, a low console table uh, downstairs uh, that basically fits the, the space perfect. Um, when I saw nature aquariums the first time or I saw planted tanks, um, I immediately fell in love with them. I mean, what's not to love? They're so beautiful. They're like a like a little ecosystem in your living room. I don't know anybody who wouldn't want one, but obviously there's a lot of challenges and expense that comes with putting, putting an aquascape together. And it's something that you really have to think about if you really want to launch into that. You can do low tech setups, um, which are a lot more inexpensive, but once you get into the high tech side of things, it actually can get pretty pricey when you're buying some equipment for it. I kind of did a bit of a mix and match and I ended up just getting some expensive equipment with some not so much expensive. Um, it's worked out okay uh, for me. Some of the things I probably could have done with uh, an upgrade on it, but it still worked out okay. And, uh, you know, it's working for what I need it for. But down the road, I'll probably end up getting better replacements for stuff if I end up having any problems with it. Um, so, yeah, just uh, keep that in mind. High tech versus low tech setup. If you're going to launch into this, you know, do your research on the difference between the two. It's mainly the equipment uh, you'll on a high tech setup. You're you're going to spend on equipment to try and grow those uh, more advanced plants um, that everybody wants to have. So, uh, yeah, for sure. Um, a low tech setup, still a great looking thing as well. Um, you know, less work, easier to grow plants. Uh, that still works out perfect, still looks pretty. Um, so do a bit of research, figure out what way you want to go with that. So uh, something to think about really with aquascaping too, if you're going to launch into it, is actually algae. Um, algae is going to happen no matter what you do. It is just unfortunately part of uh, the whole hobby. Everybody has experienced it at some stage. It can happen at any stage. Um, but I guess one of the, the best ways to control it is to make sure that your parameters are correct in your water and your plants are out competing your algae. Um, it's a bit of a balance that you need to strike and it takes some time to get there. Um, I guess one of the, the biggest tips about it is to plant heavily to begin with. 
um, and to try and make sure that algae never gets a chance to establish. Now it will establish anyway um, when you start an aquarium for the first time uh, just because of the whole cycle but um, that's another topic that we could get into in a bit more detail. So uh, definitely for sure if you're that type of person that doesn't have the patience to try and deal with stuff uh, you know challenges that come up that may take some weeks to actually get rid of aquascape it may not be for you um so it's it, it's not one of those types of things that you can just say hey you know i'm going to build myself an aquascape and then i'm going to set it and forget it it actually requires a lot of ongoing maintenance all the time uh so if you're not really up for that i would advise to just go for something that's a bit more low tech and low maintenance um so you don't have to put in some hours I pretty much put in at least an hour every day um, into my aquascape and some days I put even more into it just to keep it the way that it is uh, and even still I want to get it to a certain level where I'm super happy with it. Right now it's probably 60 to 70 percent of the way there but you know uh, the mecca for me with it is that you know I have a lush carpet growing and you know it's uh, basically um, giving off those beautiful bubbles that everybody wants to see. Um, so yeah, it's going to take some time for me to get mine 100% there, but it is a lot of work. It's a labor of love. Uh, so, you know, make sure when you get yourself involved in this and you start investing in the equipment that you know you're going to put the time and the effort into it because that's quite important. Something else to consider when you're setting up your first aquascape is where you're actually going to put your aquascape. Um, so for me, mine is down on our main level and I get a lot of passive light coming in uh, during the day because we have an open concept living room. Um, so our living room and kitchen all blend into one and we have a lot of big windows. So the problem with that is that I cannot control the amount of light that's coming into the room because I obviously I live with my wife and uh, you know there's uh, people in and out all the time and there's a, a lot of traffic so uh, for that reason you may not want to put it in your living room. Uh, it's very hard to control the amount of light that's, that's going to be on your aquarium at all times. Um, it may be better that you have a specific room that you have your aquascapes in. Uh, just to make sure that you've been a way of actually controlling the amount of light that actually hits it and the reason for that really is because you want your first of all the main one is algae uh, you will get a lot of algae growth if you um, if you don't actually consider that uh, because algae basically will thrive off high amounts of light um, so you kind of want to be keeping it between six and eight hours a day of light um, there once you have your plants established and they're grown really well you can extend that lighting period but at the beginning you want to keep it fairly low um, and the other thing about it too is that you want to get your fish in a good circadian rhythm too. So if your lights are constantly going on and off all the time in, in a certain room, um, even if it's just like passive lighting from the ceiling, uh, your fish are going to be kind of all over the place because they won't know whether it's night or day. So um, it's kind of good for their health just to keep them in a good circadian rhythm. So with my aquarium, just with regards to, you know, the uh, the equipment that I set up in mine, um, I actually, the filter uh, that I put in is a canister filter from Awaze. Um, Awaze are a really good company. I kind of jumped in the deep end with it and I went for the best filter that I could pretty much get. Now, the one that I have is the Awaze Biomaster Thermo 250. Um, basically, that filter is a canister filter um, and it's quite advanced. It's got a double chamber in it that you can uh, clean the one portion of it every few weeks and the other every few months. Um, that basically cuts down on the amount of maintenance that you're doing with it, which is nice. And also it has the heater built into it. Now that's worked out really well for me. I love that setup. I don't like unsightly heaters inside the tank. Um, so if you're kind of like that and you want to keep it as minimalist as possible with your aquascape, you might want to you know, go down that road. Um, it's been a, a fantastic filter for me. I have no complaints about it. I might even do an in-depth video on it to kind of go through it and explain how it all works. Um, the other things that I've uh, put into my aquarium too, um, mine being high tech, is that I have an injected CO2 system. Um, so I kind of went for a middle of the road expense um, regulator. Um, it's from a company called F-Zone and I bought it on um, Amazon. There are far more expensive ones that you can do. You can get some custom made ones. If you're on some of the forums, some people will actually build them out for you. Um, and then there's other ones too, like CO2 art. Uh, there's some really good ones out there um, and really what it comes down to is consistency. A lot of the reviews I've seen from people is that there's just no consistency in the bubbles per second or um, you know the bubbles per, per minute that are coming out. So for me I haven't noticed that the bubbles per second have been fairly consistent and I haven't had any problems. Um, so so far so good everything's working out there. The one thing I did notice though is that with the diffuser uh, make sure you invest in a half decent diffuser. If you don't have a good diffuser, the bubbles will never be small enough to actually dissipate into the water. And for that reason, it's kind of, um, you end up with a really bad gas exchange and you're just wasting carbon dioxide that's just 
coming outside the water then uh, larger bubbles are not good um, a tip for that though is even if you do buy a cheaper diffuser you might want to soak it for a few weeks um, and i kind of found this out by accident but when i uh, had sickness in my tank i had ick i turned off my co2 for a couple of weeks and uh, that allowed the diffuser to actually soak in water for a couple of weeks without use and ever since i've turned it back on i'm actually noticing that the bubbles are far smaller so uh, just a tip there you may want to just soak it for a couple of weeks just to see if that actually helps most of those diffusers have ceramic plates in them and i think they recommend that you soak them anyway uh, so yeah that would be a good thing to do and you'll probably notice a big difference in the bubbles so also in my aquarium i'm actually running a uh, surface skimmer so all the equipment that i mentioned um, in this video today i'll actually put links down below for the ones that i bought so the uh, surface skimmer that I bought, it's actually, um, it's not one of the most expensive ones. Uh, I think one of the most popular ones is the Eheim uh, surface skimmer, but um, I went with one that was a, a bit of a, a non-brand name one, um, and it's actually worked out really well. It's been fantastic. Uh, the main reason you want a surface skimmer is that you want to take that uh, surface scum off the top of the water. It's like a buildup of bacterial colonies and proteins. And basically what happens there is that it just gets really thick uh, and it ends up just building up a film and that doesn't allow the proper gas exchange between the air and water where you need to release your CO2 out and bring your oxygen in. Uh, so what you might notice is that if you don't clean up that surface scum or have a uh, surface skimmer, um, you may end up seeing that that protein eventually becomes quite thick. And if you actually touch it or try and remove it, it gets clumpy and starts sticking to plants and stuff like that. And it's really just nasty and unsightly. So if you can uh, do yourself a favor, get a surface skimmer. Uh, they also keep all the plant matter off the top of the water too and the uh the main benefit i i guess i have had out of it is that it's like my tank is quite long and i suffer with really bad flow down my tank which is a haven for algae to grow so um now that i have the surface skimmer in it's actually blowing the uh the water uh, back up out of the outlet um that that comes with it um and that's actually provided some flow extra flow into the tank that i really needed so uh, definitely well worth it um get yourself a surface skimmer so the light that I'm using in this aquarium is actually a light from Nycrew. Um, so I bought this from Amazon and it's worked out really well. It's not a full spectrum light. It's actually just got the uh, blue and white channels. Um, but that's worked out for me because um, I don't really have any red plants in there just yet. And uh, the fish that I have don't really have many reds in them. So um, I'm actually pretty happy with it so far. There's some very good reviews on it. It's really slim. Uh, it kind of ties in really nicely with the whole look. So um, I was really happy with it. I'll stick a link down below for that. Um, just uh, on that I had to modify mine a little bit because the way that I had actually created my aquarium I couldn't just sit the light down on top of it because um, I, I put in a brace and that brace kind of gets in the way um, so for that reason I had to modify it and actually bend the, the steel um, legs of it to actually pop it up and prop it up a little bit now that said you do lose some light um, because once you prop it up higher you end up losing some of the light because uh, obviously the further away the light is the less that you get into the aquarium uh, but I mean it, it hasn't really been an issue for me so it's actually worked out alright. Just a little bit on hardscape then uh, so you, you probably noticed from my aquarium that I, I have a very nice piece of Mopani that sits in the middle of the aquarium and what you kind of want to do with an aquascape is you want to make sure that the way that you put your hardscapes in it's actually well balanced so it's actually very difficult to put a piece of driftwood in the middle of an aquarium and balance it um, I was just very lucky in the pieces of stone that I bought, which are Siryu stone. They're like a Japanese uh, stone that's quarried. I believe they don't uh, ship it out of Japan anymore, but there's still plenty of it online to buy and you'll see it in some pet stores. Um, but I'm using Siryu stone and Mopani and I was kind of lucky in just the way that it worked out. I had enough of all of it to actually make it look and work well. Um, the only thing I don't like about it is that uh, obviously the driftwood kind of tilts back towards the back of the uh, aquarium. So I don't really get to see what happens at the back of the aquarium because sometimes the fish just hide in there. Um, but I mean, other than that, it actually looks really pretty and it's worked out really well. Um, just a couple of tips on your hardscape. I would advise that you soak your hardscape before you put it in. I didn't do that. Um, I ended up getting a lot of leech tannins coming out of that driftwood and they're pretty much only beginning to stop now. Um, and I ended up having to put Purigen into uh, my filter. Now, some people run Purigen anyway, just because it actually will remove, uh, you know, any of the that dirty look or cloudy look out of your water. Uh, but it's been very good for removing tannins and my water has pretty much cleared up now and it's it's fairly clean most of the time and it looks sparkly, uh, sparkly clear. So that's kind of the look that I wanted to go for. 
so for sure, if you're going to get any type of driftwood, my recommendation will be to boil it or soak it for a few weeks before you put it in. Otherwise, you will be on the back foot with a lot of water changes trying to get rid of those tannins out of the water. Now that said, you might be going for a brackish look. Uh, a lot of fish come from brackish waters, so some people like to do that sort of black water tank or brown water tank. Um, so if that's the case, the, it'll work out well for you. But if you want that crystal clear look that you see on all the aquascapes online, uh, tannins will destroy that and it'll be very frustrating. So be careful with the driftwood that you put in and the treatments that you do beforehand. So another thing about uh, my aquarium is the substrate that I'm running. So the, the substrate that I have is ADA Aquasoil Amazonia, which is a really popular one. Um, a lot of uh, aquascapers will go down that direction. Underneath that substrate, I'm running a ADA Power Sand S. Um, now the the top um, Amazonia soil that I'm running is the powder version. There is a, a regular version of it as well, but the powder one looks better in my opinion for the smaller, longer scapes. Uh, just because the uh, the sizing and the ratio of size actually works out to look much better. Um, and then the power sand that's underneath it then is like a pebbled stone that actually has um, nutrients in it for your uh, plants to put the roots through and actually um, gather those nutrients up. So that's actually worked out really well for me. Nearly every plant I've put into my aquarium has, has grown and I've had no problems. The only plant I've really had an issue with is Anubius um, and it really is finicky about being moved. Now, the mistake that I made is that I moved mine a couple of times and it started to melt. So if you're gonna put a Nubius down, make sure wherever you put it, you're gonna leave it there. Um, another one that I have is Rhinecki, and uh, that's a more red color plant. Um, I nearly lost that plant completely. It was melted to the point where it, was, it literally had nothing left. And it's actually come back now and it's starting to grow again. So um, just because I've left it alone and I haven't really bothered with it, it's very hard when you set an aquascape up because you just want to fiddle with things all the time and you just want to keep moving things around to get things right. Um, with plants, you've got to be careful though because moving them around can actually upset them and they melt and before you know it, you've lost your plant. So just be careful with that type of thing. Some plants then, I'll just I'll give a list of all the plants that I have in my aquarium at the moment, but I just kind of wanted to give a couple of tips about it. When I bought my plants, I didn't really put much thought into the process of uh, what plants I wanted and why I wanted them. Um, my aquarium is quite low and shallow and certain plants don't work very well in a low and shallow aquarium just purely because it's just not very tall and a lot of plants like to grow very tall. So I have an, uh, um, an Amazon sword in my tank and that can grow really, really tall. Now, luckily it's actually worked out quite well and the leaves just span across the top of the water and everything is okay. Um, but there's other plants in there too that like to grow very tall. So I will list all the plants that I have in there. Uh, some of them I have more regrets about buying than, than others. Uh, big thing about bringing plants in is make sure that you wash them off and you, you uh, rinse them out in a, uh, a diluted bleach solution. The reason for that is you're gonna bring pests into your tank. Uh, I have a lot of bladder snails and I also brought in two damselfly nymphs from not washing my plants off properly before I brought them in. So if you're gonna bring plants in uh, from an outside source, you can never be guaranteed that they don't have any pests. The only ones that pretty much guarantee it are Tropica 1-2 Grow, uh, just because that they are uh, tissue cultures that are grown in labs, uh, which are completely pest free. So anyone that you get from a pot, it does a likelihood that there's eggs of some sort on that, or there's there could be some sort of um, pest that's hiding in there that you can't see. So uh, just make sure you do your due diligence and give those plants a clean before you put them in, rinse them off, and hopefully you don't have the issues uh, that I have had with some of mine. Well, the last thing I want to talk about is the fish that I have in my aquarium um, and give a few tips about that. So the fish that I have in there, I'll just name them all out for you. I have a betta fish in there. I call him Seamus. Good Irish name for him. Um, so I got my betta fish from one of the local uh, um, aquarium stores. I, I won't name it, but as you kind of get into having fish, you, I'm more of the type of person that I like to get them from a sustainable source. Um, where you know that I know that the animals are being treated correctly. Now, initially with the fish that I bought from my aquarium, I didn't really do any of that and I kind of have regrets about it. Going forward, I'm gonna be buying all my fish from breeders. Now, there's nothing wrong with buying your fish from pet stores or aquarium stores. Um, just for me, uh, just for peace of mind, I prefer that I actually buy them from a breeder and that you kind of know where you're getting them from and the chances of them being sick is quite low. Um, nearly every fish that I brought into my aquarium since I've got it um, has actually uh, brought on a sickness. 
Um, so I did have a really bad case of ick, which I resolved just recently, and I'll probably do a video about that. Um, I used the temperature treatment to get rid of it and it worked out really well, but um, just be really careful with the fish that you're bringing in. Make sure you quarantine them properly. Um, so I've just to name all the fish that I have, um, I have a beta fish in there. So he is a uh, Dumbo beta um, and uh, he is beautiful. He's a uh, multicolored red, green, blue and white. And um, I also have two Chinese algae eaters, um, which I got them when they were tiny. They've grown quite a lot since I've got them. Uh, I may need to rehome them eventually because they do get quite aggressive. Um, I have uh, four green neons. I started out with seven Celestial Pearl Danios and I lost some of them through my ick. Uh, and now I've got four left, um, which is a shame. Uh, but right now that's pretty much uh, all that I have in there. I don't have a lot. Um, I do have a few shrimp. I have uh, two Amano shrimp and one cherry shrimp. Um, they tend to hide at night just because the uh, algae eaters are a little bit more on the aggressive side and they scare them so they've been hiding away but eventually I hope to rehome those Chinese algae eaters so my shrimp can come out. Uh, they have started coming out a bit more in the day now uh, but it's just it's become a more and more rare to see them which is uh, not what I wanted so I will be uh, definitely be home with those algae eaters so I can get those guys back out. So just a few tips on buying stock for your aquarium. Just make sure that you fully know what you're getting yourself into with the aquarium fish that you buy. Some of them do have more aggressive tendencies than others. Some of them don't work very well together because of aggression. And then there's some interspecies aggression too where the males can be quite aggressive with each other within the same species. Or they can be aggressive with the females as well. The thing I've noticed about CPDs is that uh, they're actually beautiful fish to have, uh, but the male that I have is actually quite dominant and aggressive, and they can actually be aggressive to each other to the point where they die of stress. So uh, when you're buying fish, um, don't expect the people in the pet stores to be giving you all the information that you need to know. Do all your own research before you buy anything. Um, I've noticed that they, not that they're holding anything back, but they don't really tell you anything up front that would deter you from buying things because they're a business. Um, so things that I would have um, liked to have known would be about um, Chinese algae eaters, for example, that they do get bigger and they get more aggressive. Um, and also too about shrimp being so, um, you know, they're very sensitive to water change. And I lost the shrimp through uh, water changes, regular cold water changes. And since then I've actually changed how I actually deal with water changes. Um, and I'll probably do a video on that because that's actually quite an important topic that I think people overlook a lot. Um, so yeah, there's things that I would have liked to have been told, but I guess there's an assumption made there that you know what you're buying and you, you kind of know what you're doing. So uh, make sure you do your research because you'll find that people in pet stores will not give you the full information on certain species of fish and you may regret it later when you actually do your research and figure out more about them. Hey guys, for this video, I just wanted to keep it nice and short, more of an intro to uh, myself and uh, who I am and how I kind of got into this to begin with. Um, over the next few weeks, I do hope to make a lot more videos and go through things in a bit more detail. Uh, I'll probably step through all the processes of everything that I've done, um, lessons that I've learned, sicknesses that my fish have had, um, and I'll try and make separate little videos for all of those and explain those in more detail. Um, so if you've enjoyed the video today and you like it, um, I would really appreciate it if you could give it a thumbs up and uh, hit the subscribe button. Um, I'm hoping to bring some really good content um, over the next few weeks. Hopefully you guys like it and it's beneficial and helpful for you. So thanks a million. I'm going to leave you off here with a little video of uh, my aquarium. You get to see Seamus and all his buddies swimming around. So uh, thanks a million guys. Take it easy and hope to see you next time.